Chicago with the lead. The Chicago Bulls have won their sixth NBA championship. I had my great reign in basketball. No matter what you guys say, if I come and hang around the game, because I still love the game better than me, I'm back. I am here to, to announce my retirement from the game of basketball. The story of Michael Jordan needs no introduction. The tales of his journey to becoming one of the greatest athletes the world has ever seen, from being cut by his high school varsity team to the flu game, have been sold countless times, some becoming somewhat legends themselves, however. For many, the journey of Jordan as a basketball icon ends the day he hung up his Bulls jersey, the headlines end, the documentary stopped filming, and the spotlight fades away. And while that was the last time the world saw Michael at his most memorable, the reality is that's not where the story ends. There's more chapters in his legacy that deserve to be explored. A brief moment in time where we saw one of the game's greats try to defy father time. And for a split second, maybe you did. Speculation has ended. Rumors confirmed. The greatest player of all time is back. And he's wearing a Wizards uniform. Following Jordan's retirement after winning his sixth championship in Chicago, professional basketball moved on just like it does. After all great players retired, MJ had distanced himself from the game as much as possible, occasionally stopping into the facilities to play pickup games, but trying hard to avoid speculation he would ever make a return. I had my great reign in basketball. No matter what you guys say, if I come and hang around the game, because I still love the game, that doesn't mean I'm coming back. The end of the 90s saw the birth of some of what would be basketball's brightest stars for decades to come. Players like Kobe Bryant, Tim Duncan, Vince Carter, and Allen Iverson all grew to become the faces of a new era in the NBA. And for a competitor like Michael Jordan, who was watching from a distance, this presented a new challenge, only this time, it wasn't on the court. After being away from the game of basketball for almost two years, in January of 2000, Michael Jordan agreed to a five-year deal to become the head of basketball operations for the Washington Wizards. This included a minority stake in the ownership of the team, which was set to raise to 20% if the Wizards exceeded expectations in his time off the court. Jordan had become increasingly interested in running a franchise, even trying to purchase the Charlotte Hornets before the deal fell through. Michael was left with the task of rebuilding a team that had finished with the second worst record in the entire NBA. On April 20th, 2001, the Wizards announced the hiring of 49-year-old Doug Collins to become the team's new head coach. Collins had been the coach of a young Michael Jordan during his early years as a Bull and had been out of the league since 1998. Naturally, this raised some speculation about whether or not Jordan was considering a comeback over the course of the offseason, Jordan hadn't made any changes. Besides adding his own former head coach and drafting a promising big man into the roster, some big questions were being raised in DC. Yeah. This is it, my head. This defines me. The entire offseason leading up to the 2001 season, Jordan had been quietly training to get back into playing shape by inviting many of the top players from around the NBA to compete in organized pickup games. On October 30th, 2001, Michael Jordan made his return to the NBA in Madison Square Garden against the Knicks. The buildup to the game made it one of the most anticipated matches of the year because the last time the world had seen Jordan on the court was the 98 Finals. Michael would score his first basket less than two minutes into the game, having an up and down game on his way to a 19 point outing. With 18 seconds left, the Wizards had the ball with the chance to tie the game. Everyone in the garden that night knew who would take the shot, and it seemed like this was the beginning of a new chapter in Jordan's legacy. Down by three, the Wizards will go on to lose by two in their opening game and leave many people wondering if Jordan had made the right decision in his return. As the early season wore on, Washington got off to a slow start, winning only two of their first 11 games and struggling to find chemistry. 
They were far from competing for championships, but Jordan still had championship expectations in practice, pushing some of the young players harder than many of them were ready for or used to. Well, like I tell people, Michael was fun. He had a unique personality. But then there was also another side where it was the talking <laughs> trash Michael Jordan. And at times, me and a couple of the young guys would come up to him and say, hey, Mike, why don't you think about putting us in the brain Jordan collection? Right. And he'd look at me and say, hey, Rip, my, sneaker for, my sneakers for all stars. The team was struggling with a newfound national spotlight. They had gotten off to a rough start, but MJ was still must-see TV. The Wizards had gone from 28th in the league in attendance to selling out every home game. They found themselves on national TV almost every night. An overtime win against the Celtics sparked a run of 16 wins over their next 25 games and put them on pace to make the playoffs for the first time since 1997. Over this stretch, Michael was averaging over 25 points per game and showcasing a scoring ability that many people didn't think he still had. After a bad loss against the Pacers, Jordan was out to prove that he could still play. Jordan's 51-point performance against the Hornets was the record for points in a game by someone over the age of 38 at that time. This was followed up by 45 points in the very next game against the Nets, proving that MJ was still capable of being one of the game's best players, even past his prime. During these two games, Jordan was scoring at will and showcasing his veteran skill set that was very much different from the Jordan we've seen in the past. Crafty layups around the rim replaced the high-flying dunks. Fadeaway elbow jumpers became his staple instead of acrobatic finishes at the rim. Michael Jordan was no longer the acrobatic player of his heydays, but he did enough where he could still prove all of the critics wrong. Heading into the All-Star break, Michael Jordan was on pace to have one of the best individual seasons of any player that year. In fact, Jordan and Kobe Bryant were the only two players in the entire league averaging 25 points, 5 assists, and 5 rebounds per game, which put Jordan at the heart of the MVP race at the midseason point. He had motivated his Wizards team to a respectful record after being one of the worst teams in the NBA the year before. Washington saw its young players like Rip Hamilton becoming reliable threats every night. Then, just as things were moving in the right direction, Jordan hurt his knee right before All-Star break. He tried to push on through the injury, but the Wizards lost nine out of the next 10 games. On February 27, Jordan elected to have arthroscopic knee surgery to repair the torn cartilage in his knee. After he attempted to make a second return, he decided to sit out for the rest of the year. Michael's second year in Washington took on a much different look from the first. Jordan was still nursing his lingering knee injury from the year prior, and he elected to come off the bench in a sixth-man role for the beginning of the season. Injuries would take a toll on the Wizards throughout the first half of the season, and this caused MJ to move back into the starting lineup. He would be the only one on the roster to play in all 82 games that season and average 37 minutes per game at the age of 40. Jordan remained the highlight of the team throughout the season, averaging 20 points per game on the year. He also scored 40 points in a game three times that season. Jordan also became the only player in NBA history up to that point to score more than 40 in a game at the age of 40. Jordan would be voted in for his final All-Star appearance. He was voted in as a reserve, but many of the players offered to give up their starting spot. Jordan finally accepted the offer from Vince Carter, his University of North Carolina alum. The game itself served as one of the last iconic moments of Jordan's career. It served as an official passing of the torch to the next generation of stars that had grown up idolizing him. Has the ball again guarded by Sean Marion. The fadeaway, yes! With four and eight-tenths seconds remaining, the West takes a timeout. Michael Jordan would play his last professional basketball game on April 16, 2003 against the 76ers. The Philly crowd was electric, and everyone wanted to get a glimpse of Michael's last moments on the hardwood. The game itself didn't have much to offer as Jordan struggled from the field and eventually took a seat with the game out of reach. As time ticked down toward the final moments of the game, the crowd chanted for Jordan to get back in the game. Michael made his way back to the scorer's table and went back in the game. 
Michael would be intentionally fouled and he hit two shots at the free throw line for the final points of his NBA career. 